It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. On his 68th birthday, today's guest, Kevin Kelly, started to write down advice for his children about things he learned in life. That list turned into his book, Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I Wish I'd Known Earlier. Kevin joins us to offer guidance for career, relationships, parenting, and more. Kevin helped launch and edit Wired Magazine, and he's written for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, among many other publications. His previous books include What Technology Wants and The Inevitable. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's such a delight. Thank you for having me. Kevin, you've had many major accomplishments in your life, and you did all of that without finishing college. Why did you decide to drop out? Oh, my gosh. You know, I uh, graduated from high school in 1970. That's more than 50 years ago. And at that time, there were no options for, like, a gap year or internship, which is really what I needed. I just needed to get out of that classroom. I could not sit in those little chairs for grade 13. And I needed something else. And there wasn't any option other than to to drop out. So I think if I'd had a gap year or something like that, I would have taken it and probably stayed in college. But my alternative at the time was to give myself my own gap year and my own internship. So I went to Asia as a photographer, and that was the the kinds of things that they need to do at that time. And you've said that taking that trip to Asia was one of the best decisions you ever made. Why was that the case? Was that a turning point in your life? Yes, it was. I, again, grew up in New Jersey, northern New Jersey. My dad worked in New York City. Um, And it's hard to describe how parochial things were back in, you know, in the 50s and 60s. And um, going to Asia just blew my mind because everything was seemingly so different and stuff I had no clue about. Um, And it was all kind of wide open. It was in transition of basically moving from third world countries to becoming some of the most futuristic places on earth. I saw all that with my own eyes. So there was both the past, which was very deep and rich, and there was the future, which was faster than what we were going. And everything was accessible and affordable to someone like me who had very little money but a lot of time. So you went on this trip, you said, as a photographer. When did you realize that you were a good writer? Oh, writing came very slowly and very laboriously. I I basically hate writing. I I like having written. (laughs) That's nice. But I don't like that process of writing. It's very painful because, for me, it's a kind of thinking. I I work with writers at Wired Magazine who are born writers and they love to write. I'm not that way. I don't have ideas and then are trying to find some ways to put them into paper. I don't have the ideas until I write them. It's the act of writing for me that that makes the ideas. Mm -hmm. And so I have to write in order to think. And that's sort of laborious and difficult. And it took me years to to learn how to do that. And actually, I learned how to write online. It turned out that I didn't know how to type, but going online early in the 80s forced me to use my fingers to type and to express things because I wanted to communicate, and I learned basically to write in that kind of telegraphic way online, which is why my little book of advice doesn't have any stories or like sentences. Mm-hmm. I'm really good with sentences. I'm not so good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I, like you, I've always hated writing, and yet I ended up in a career where I write and yeah. I'm writing a book. There so it's go. it's comical really if you think about it yeah 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 it is it's i i'm I'm a very reluctant writer and and also the other thing i learned um and this is some of my advice in the book about not trying to be the best but the only i learned um by trying to give away my ideas and hiring other people to write stories that 
There were stories and ideas that I simply couldn't get anybody else to write. I tried for years to pay them to write it. Nobody thought they were good ideas. Those were the ideas I found up, wound up doing myself, again, that I couldn't tell anybody else to, to do. And it turned out those are the ones that I had to write myself, and that's were my best pieces. Yeah. And so there was this, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like, I write out of desperation. If I can't get someone else to say it, then I have to say it, and then I have to figure out how I say it. And so it's a laborious process, but um, it is really, for me, the only way for me to, to have ideas is to force myself to try and write them. And Kevin, I love your new book because, you know, as I've gotten older and everything that I'm doing professionally, I've really done by the seat of my pants. I I started one career, put it on hold for 17 years to raise a family, and then that life was basically ripped away from me. And so I created this brand and I incorporated my first business. And it was all done, you know, like I said, by the seat of my pants. I don't have an MBA. I, I wasn't a business major in college. And, and I really do believe that experience is the best way to learn. And you've put in all this wealth of information together in an easy-to-read-and-digest to, to format. And if you would indulge me, I, I'd like to play a little bit of a game with you. It's kind of like a lightning round. I've selected okay. a few of my favorite pieces of advice from your book, and I'd like to share them with you, and then maybe we can kind of talk about each of them and, and get your take on them. Yes. So... The first one, and and I really love this, especially with the world we've been living in in recent years, and, and this one is, learn how to learn from those you disagree with or even offend you. See if you can find the truth in what they believe. And, you know, in, in like I said, in, in recent years, we've really witnessed people being intolerant or unwilling to hear or learn from another point of view. What does this piece of advice mean to you personally? Yeah, it's... it's um... I'm constantly surprised that um, people that I may vehemently disagree with will often turn out to have something that I can learn from. And um, I've learned that we don't have to like everybody, but we have to respect them. And if you respect the person, then that gives you a chance to hear what it is they may have. Because even though people may be fundamentally wrong and, uh, and, and there, there will always be something that we will agree on and there will always be something that they believe that it's true no matter how much we think that's contrary. And so getting past that disagreeableness, that, 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 that division, that will pay off. And it doesn't mean in the end that we have to like them. It, it just means that we have to understand that, that there is something we can learn from them. And um, I find that that's been incredibly helpful um, as I go through life and meet people that I disagree with. Um, so another bit of advice in the book, which is that you don't have to attend every argument that you were invited to. So it doesn't mean you have to argue with them. It means that you have to listen and question and try to get to understand what, what they're, why they believe that they believe what they believe. And I think um, I have found that that's – I'm not going to change the world necessarily, but I – I become better because I have listened to them. Yeah, and it's really, you know, the only way we can come to compromise or or be able to have relationships with people who may differ. It's having that open mind and being willing to listen. And like you said, there's always something to learn. We all don't know yeah. everything. And, um, no, I, you know, don't. and that's why I thought that one was so important to start off with. Yeah, I think so. Um, another bit of advice. It, this is a book of 450 sentences, basically. Another sentence talks about the fact that um, every person that I have met has turned out to be basically an expert on something that I didn't even know about. And it doesn't matter who they are. There's, they usually know a lot more about something that I have known nothing about. And it's not always obvious what it is. And if I'm sitting next to them at a party or waiting in line, or whatever I encounter them, I make it a little bit of a game to try to find out what it is that they are passionate and expert on. And it's always amazing. And they just light up when they get to share what it is that they know more about most people. Um, And again, it's not obvious what that will be because it's often not what their job is about. And so, Kevin, here's another one. If we all threw our troubles into a big pile and we saw everyone else's problems we would immediately grab ours back. And, yeah. well, you know, and this was actually really true in my life because I had gone through a lot of trauma, as I said, years ago. 
And I remember one of the first interviews I had done during that time was with a woman who was a quadriplegic. And I remember going home after speaking with her, really saying to myself, like, what is wrong with you? You know, it puts things into perspective. We all have problems, but I I think when we focus on on someone else's troubles, it it really helps us to see that we're not alone. We're not alone, and and, um, in a curious way, our problems are suited to us, and other people's problems are not suited to us. This is why we kind of you kind of want to have your own problems, um, the problems that you have. And so um, it it is true that that that's another reason for listening is, is if you listen to people, and you begin to have an appreciation of where they're coming from and what they're dealing with. It's like, yeah, I'm I, I don't I don't want that. I'm glad I have the problems that I have. All these pieces of advice, you know, while they're written alone, as as you can see, it's such a great way to live because they tie together. You know, you're talking about listening to someone, but now you're, you're dealing with problems and, and everything that you're teaching us, it it ties together to a higher way of living. Yeah, it it, it does. Um, And most, I mean, I I, I don't want to assign too much um, uh, weight to these. These are aphorisms, little proverbs. I've tried to take an entire book and reduce it down to one sentence as a way just to remind ourselves, remember, mostly myself, um, these things to change your behavior. So, so it's like, you know, um, like here, here's a, I'm just looking at this randomly myself. It's like be prepared when you, when you have 90% of a large project completed, finishing the final details will take another 90%. I mean, it's like if you've ever done a house remodel or worked on a book, or done any kind of a large PhD project or anything, it's like that first 90%, you think, okay, 90%, I have 10% left. No, 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 you have another 90%. It's those little details, all the footnotes, the trim on the house, you know, the, 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 the little bit of um, the color correction on the photos. Those all take another 90%. So we kind of always tend to underestimate the amount of time that the details at the very end take up. So you kind of have to budget for that. That's Mm -hmm. a bit of a piece of advice. And another one, and and this is a a big issue for so many people, and and I would love to get your input on it because of of your professional career, but it's about failure. And and what you write is a multitude of bad ideas is necessary for one good one. And, And what happens to so many people is we're so afraid of failing or, or that something may go wrong, we don't take any action. So how were you able to apply this one to your life and your professional career? Yeah, it's, it's something I did learn at um, Wired, working on magazines, is that um, you really do need just lots of ideas, and most of them are not going to be very good, and you don't want to get hung up on the fact that, that you're producing mediocre ideas because you, you kind of have to go through those to get to the good ones. It's really peculiar how that works. And if you watch any kind of a really innovative painter, like, say, a Picasso, there's documentaries of him watching him work, you see that he's kind of like going through painting all kinds of mediocre and not very good paintings to get to the good one because he just doesn't stop and it keeps going forward. And that's true for any kind of creative endeavor there's a necessary stage of, of, of just producing things that aren't good, and you can't get hung up on the fact that they're not good. You're just going to keep repeating it and trying to, what we say, fail forward, going, go, going further, failing better. And um, the, the professionals are basically people who understand that, who understand that, um, that the only way to get to these really great things is to kind of iterate through stages of producing things that aren't so good in the meantime, and not getting hung up on the fact that they're no good, but just like going back and using that as a kind of a data point. Uh, you know, oh, I got that out of my system. I can go on to the next one and make it a little tiny bit better if possible. And so that is sort of, in, in my eyes, the mark of a professional is someone who can go through and keep making stuff and then also understanding that if, if they do have a mistake or a failure or something works, that it, they recover from it rather than having them stop what they're doing. And I've tried to eliminate the word failure from my vocabulary because I was one of those people for many years. And what I just tell myself is it's a learning experience because what does failure really mean anyway? It's subjective. So it's just, you know, like you said, it's a creative process. You start with something, you build on it, you alter it, but it's not the end of the road. 
No, no, it's not. It's it's, and and, and that's one of the reasons why almost anybody who do knows and researches habits um, knows that doing things on a regular basis is really the only way to, to make anything great. And what happens when you do things on a regular basis, whether it's writing or song or you're, you're a musician or you're an athlete and you're performing or you're um, a, a, you know, an x-ray doctor and you're, and you're doing diagnosis, you do it on a regular basis. And what that allows you to do several things is one is, that, as we said, it can generate the, the bad stuff enough that you can get to the good stuff. But the other thing that it does is that um, it gives you confidence that you can pr- keep producing things so that you can give away and forget or forget things. When you do it a lot, you come to understand that the more you do it, the deeper the well gets, Th- that there's no sense of like I'm going to run out of ideas or I'm going to run out of things because I'm, I'm doing something every day. You find the opposite, that the more you do it, the, the more there seems to be at the bottom. And so it gives you the confidence so like, oh, yeah, that's an idea. I'll throw that one away because I know that tomorrow I'm going to have another great idea. And so I, I can afford to give it away, throw it away, let it go, um, because I have proven to myself over and over again that there's more where that has come from. And, and another nugget of wisdom that actually ties in with what we're talking about is don't measure your life with someone else's ruler. And that's why I think we're so afraid of failing because we want the approval of other people. So when you can stop looking for that approval, when you can stop feeling this need to be accepted, I think that's when you can live more freely. It, it is true. I, I think a lot of us inherit or are given a kind of a definition of success. And, and, and we, see, we see kind of people who are, you know, the best golfer in the world or the best, or, um, you know, uh, the best uh, musician, the guitarist, or the best mathematician and 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 that's sort of like a a formula that that we imagine that we need to do to be successful we we need to be like that but that's kind of like someone else's movie it's much more likely that you'll find your success by being not the best but being being the only going in a, your a, a different direction you kind of want to be inventing your own definition of success which may not include having a billion dollars <laughs> and sh- it probably shouldn't because it's it's not very helpful, and so, um, so, so, so you're kind of um, you, you want to be free in that sense to 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 not follow what other people's definition of success is, but see if you can um, head in a direction where maybe no one's gone before, where where there, where it might take some time to kind of explain to other people what it is that you're doing. That's actually a good sign that says you're likely. And to, to find something that's best for you in that way. Mm-hmm. And so, Kevin, I just shared a few of my favorites with you. Do you have a piece of advice from the book that is your favorite? I know there's so many in there, but is there one that really stands out for you? Well, I've kind of hinted around one, which is don't aim to be the best, aim to be the only. Try to go in a direction where what it is that you're doing, you find easy to do, but other people find hard, where you are doing something that other people um, don't want to do or can't really do. And everybody has something like that. We're all different mixtures of talents and abilities and life experiences which can contribute to us to, to have something special. And what we want to do is in some ways move our life in that direction. If you're young and normal like most of us, like me, you don't know what it is when you're young, what, what you're really best at or what you're good at. And it take you a while and different experiments, different failures, and experiments to kind of arrive at some sense of what you can do a little bit differently than other people. And you'll never really arrive there. You don't ever really kind of arrive at being the only. It's, it's not a destination. It's, it's kind of a direction. You're kind of moving all the time in that general direction of trying to be something a little different. And so the bit of advice I would have is, like, if, if at all possible, try to work on somewhere where there's not a name or not the language for what it is that you're doing because that's that's a good suggestion that you're headed in the right direction. The book is Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I Wish I'd Known Earlier. Kevin, where can our listeners go to get more information about you and your work? Oh, well, I have a website that very conveniently has my initials, KK. Uh, so I'm at kk.org, 
where I have um, all the projects I've been working on, my 50 years of photography in Asia, the Lung Now Foundation, where we encourage long-term thinking. We built a clock inside a mountain that's ticking for 10,000 years. And the stuff that I write about, the future of technology, can all be found there. And once again, that website is kk.org. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. It was a real delight, Joan. Thank you for your great questions. I really appreciate your spirit and willingness to try stuff, and I wish you the best success in your own book. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.